So my name is Benjamin Farr, Farmer Ben. I'm uh, here in Oakland um, doing some urban farming for the last 10 years. I've been farming for about 25 years. Started in a very small market garden uh, production system in Carmel Valley that was modeled after the um, UC Santa Cruz program, the CASFA program, um, Center for Agroecology and Food Systems. And that journey has been amazing. And it's, it's, I feel very uh, grateful and honored to be with you all and see how this movement has just incredibly um, has, has transformed and changed and gained such great momentum. So happy to share whatever I can. So today I wanted to talk with you about um, the compost tea because it was something like I feel like you were um, you were using for a long time. So the first question I had is what is your experience with it and how much does it improve your farming? Yeah, so my experience with compost tea started when I in, in 1997 when I first got introduced to farming through Bob Kennard at a uh, conference that he spoke at and the topic of the of the talk was um uh the shaman of the soil um which is kind of a you know probably not the best uh best title for it but the the concept was just like the the mystery and magic that that bob uh approaches farming and that the soil is the key component and in that Uh, in that talk, you know, he, he shared a lot, mostly his enthusiasm that afterwards I, I went to him and I said, you know, that was so inspiring. It makes me want to do it. And he's like, then do it. And that was, that was what kicked it all off. And so I, I started farming from that point on. And one of the things that uh, he spoke about that really, really like resonated with me um, in that mystery part was like, you know, he said, we have, we have pockets on most of our clothing and those pockets are for seeds and soil and wherever you go you should gather seeds and wherever you go you should gather soil and when he talked about soil he was talking about the 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 microorganisms that are in the soil and finding good healthy soil getting that and then inoculating your farm with it through uh, a process of of um, inoculation through water through tea And then he spoke about the, the mountain tea coming from the, from the creek and the rivers and the, the, the charge that it has and the, and the, and, and the micronutrients and all of this, all these concepts that were just like, okay, this makes sense in the, in a way of looking at our crops and our farm as a living entity. And he, you know, he also said, you know, do, do I feed you? If you think about your soil and your crops as, as, entities and as sentient beings, you know, or as yourself, you know, do I feed you once a big meal every two weeks? You know, that's what fertilizer is kind of like. It's like, okay, every one to two weeks, you're going to give them a dose or you're going to put stuff in the soil and, and, you know, what, and, and, and it really helps when you actually feed them a little bit all the time. And so that kind of kicked me off into understanding and, and looking at nutrient cycles within, um, within the farming component. A few years later, like two years later, I, I did my permaculture design course uh, at the OAC, Occidental Arts and Ecology in 99. And in that, we, we dove in into farming and we also dove into compost teas. And I started just making them and, and experimenting and trialing and doing stuff. And, and you know, Bob's words to me um, at that time were, you know, the more you do, the more you have to do. So... The more involved you get, the more you can. It's it so involved. exciting, <laughs> like yeah. you know, and I'm like, wow, I want to try this. Yeah, well, you know, one one thing, I guess, actually, the first exposure though to compost tea was a few years, um, few years mm -hmm. earlier. But then it was after that talk that I I started uh, land stewarding on a farm where the the owner had been doing compost teas passively in an anaerobic place right so he was taking fish and fish guts from when he would um when he would go fishing put them in a garbage can with water and then just let it sit for like three months and you'd open and i came across it because i was working in the orchard and i opened up the bin i was i almost passed out it was so intense i'm like what is this he's like, oh that's my fish soup and i'm like for what and he's like for my plants and we give it to the figs and literally like the next day you would see them just like boost out you know and it went And, you know, 
I, as I went into my journey, I realized, okay, there's anaerobic and aerobic teas, um, and there's beneficial in microorganisms and there's non-beneficial ones. And there's like a whole world of intricacy you can get into with teas. So it's pretty amazing stuff. And so since, since I started farming and feeding plants and soil, I've always been doing teas at some, at some capacity. Wow. And yeah. Do you feel like it, it, is it measurable on your farm, the difference? Can you explain how, like, have you, have you been able to come see the difference? I know it's a big question in the compost area. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, I think the answer is yes. Um, uh, increasing cycling, increasing yield. If you increase the nutrient cycle, you increase the yield. So the idea of like increasing that digestion with and that capacity within the soil will you'll have a result. Now, measurable results, visual results. Like, I guess it depends on what you're measuring, and if you're looking like. Because there are sometimes just immediate visual results that one can see. And then other times there's longer term results that you can see. Um, I like to think of compost tea. It's like kombucha for your plants, right? So it's like you're drinking kombucha and you're like, okay, is this good for you? Can you see the results? And you're like, well, it's full of probiotics and I feel good. And it's, you know, you know, but then are you also drinking you know, say Coca-Cola or going out to, you know, fast food while you're doing that. It's like, so, you know, that will counteract the results. So it's, you kind of have to look at a holistic uh, health regime for your soil, my soil microbiome. And if the, if the microbiome of the soil is healthy and you're feeding it as if it's like a kombucha for your, for your soil, then you're going to be building up more resiliency. And so I think when you, that when you notice it most is when, there is stress on the farm. So whether it's uh, pest pressure or drought or just resiliency in total to, to, to the crop, that's when, if you have this, this like buildup of resiliency, that's when it will, um, you'll notice the difference. Um, compost tea, I would say, is not like what, like a normal fertilizer or a spray meaning that you have an issue with nitrogen and we're used to like going, okay, and you get the, the fish or the, the bone or whatever the, um, whatever the fertilizer you have, you mix it, you give it to them. You're like, okay, I've, I've met that need. Or you have a pest pressure or you have an iron deficiency, whatever it is, you have like something that's been put into a bottle that is potent and meets that need. Compost tea is more of like a holistic approach to everything that's going on. And if all of a sudden you're like, oh, I need nitrogen. Yeah, you can brew up a tea and make it more nitrogenous by adding, you know, more, which is what often what I do. I usually make a base stock that's like the kombucha, right? And then adding whether it's phosphorus or nitrogen or a micronutrient or, um, you know, different minerals, like whatever, like there might be lacking. I'll put that in there as well towards the end to tilt the tea in whatever direction. So tomatoes, great example, brew the tea while they're in their vegetative state, we'll be adding a little more fish and kelp and stuff. And then when they go into their, their flowering, then we'll go into a more phosphorus based, you know, uh, additive, you know, to kind of tip it into that scale. Um, so, you know, the more, the resiliency is where you actually start to see the, the problem. The same with like, you're going to have a cold or, you get an exposure. If you have a healthy gut, which is your first defense, right? Your gut microbiome is your first defense to disease and inflammation yep. or inflammation is the result of that. And so if you have a healthy system, when that comes into it, you're going to be resilient. So it's the same with the soil. The soil microbiome is the first defense against things. So if it's healthy and robust, then when things come through your farm, you'll be more prepared for that. Not yep. everything, but a lot of them. Yeah. And big question there. I really love the, um, the way you see it. And But is it worth the time and the effort for most farmers to do it? Because, you know, efficiency... Is that a yes or no question? <laughs> or is it... Well, uh, yes, it's totally worth the effort. Anything. I feel like you think it's worth it. 
and I no, I get I get what you're saying because it's like it's like uh, there's so much to do. The here's, yeah, yeah. The more you do, the more you have to do. So here's the thing: it's like you got um, you got the T, you got your setup, and there's like many different setups you could do. We yep. talk a little bit about that, but like you're gonna brew a tea, and there's compost extracts, tea extracts, and then it's like what are you brewing for? Right? Is is your first question? Are you doing bacterial based or fungal based? And Elaine Ingham and a whole other like soil food web folks, they've like dialed the science down to this. And over the last 10 years, the progression of science in this realm is like, is like totally, uh, there's been so much more information. Like I did a document in like 2004 when I was doing a lot of teaching. And I look at that document now and I'm like, okay, there's a lot of this stuff that's, that's good. <laughs> But a lot of stuff has changed. There's been so much more study. Uh, you know, Dr. Ingham has really looked at like the fungal and bacterial relationship between plants. And especially if you're like rotating crops, because they've noticed that there's certain um, exudates and different, you know, micro, micro, microbiology communities yep. that thrive with different crops. And if you change from a brassica to Solanaceae to, you know, and you like start moving through the whole community has to shift underneath as well. And so it's actually more, it's better if the brassica can stay kind of in a rhythm and you're just like, you're rotating with cover crops or different things, but you're like keeping that same biology going that helps those plants grow and get the nutrients they need. And so then you go, okay, am I, am I brewing a fungal tea or am I brewing a bacterial tea? Because we know that certain crops like bacteria based uh, connections and other ones like fungal based connections. And then is this something that I'm feeding the soil? Just like when you do cover crops, it's like, what am I growing my cover crop for? Am I growing it to, to fix nitrogen? Am I growing it to, for biomass, right? If I'm going for nitrogen, I'm going to wait till that optimum time, terminate the crop, turn it in. If I'm going for biomass, I'm going to let it go beyond that nitrogen, let it get to its full maturity, turn it in and get in because I'm going for that soil organic matter. So it's the same with the compost tea. We're looking at like, what is it that we're brewing for? And it's very specific. So if you're doing a compost tea extract, you're only going four to six hours. Okay. And you've extracted it and then, and it's fungal. And then it starts to churn. And then at six to eight to 12 hours, it starts to go bacterial. And then after 12 hours, it's eaten everything up in there, the food that's in there, and it's hungry at that point. And so then you have to start feeding it. And it's usually like molasses or some kind of sugar or something. So then you're like, then, and if, and then what happens too at like the 12 to 14 hours, um, people have, anyone who's had compost tea, who's done compost tea, you miss, you, you'll miss your window. It just happens. You're like, the kids got to go to bed and do stuff. And then you're like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't apply the tea. Oh, I'll get to it in the morning. You come in the morning and it's bubbling over. It's like, there's like all this, this foam just coming out. I've come out sometimes and all of a sudden the foam is like going down the stairs, you know, it's like, and what that is, is that's the energy. That's the force of all that, all the, the microbes and everything in there. And you actually want, you, you don't want that to explode in the brewer. You want that to get into the soil and take off in the soil. Like a good friend of mine who's done a lot of work with Rodale and, and Dr. Ingham and stuff. He's like, what he's noticed is like, if you can get it to where it's about to, it's about to just go for it. Cause what it's doing there is it's just multiplying. Right. And so you're taking a little bit of compost or a little bit of soil and you're putting it in here, you're aerating it. And that's creating, that's basically multiplying it by a huge amount. So is it, is it good? Yes. How much compost do you put into your garden and just, it just disappears. You can never, it can never take enough. You can constantly just put more and more tons of compost and it just seems to just like disappear into the soil. So it's like, and, and that's a lot of trucking and a lot of resources and a lot of moving. You can take a 10th of that compost, put it in a brewer, not even that, just a few handfuls feed it, get it going, brew it, and then spread that out through the water. And basically you're, you're inoculating your soil that's in place. Wow. So instead of inoculating your soil with the physical material of the compost, take a little bit of that compost, brew it up and inoculate your base soil. That's already there with more microbes. And you could just continually fertigate into it. That's probably the best 
way is like getting either a siphon injector or a mazzy injector or some kind of fertigation injector, hook it up. So every time you're watering, you're feeding just a little bit of tea all the time into the soil. And if it's a base stock, then you, you can't overdo it. Like what happens when you have a problem? It's like John Jevons. He's like, just put compost on it. Right. It's like, <laughs> it's like you got a problem. Just put some compost on it. I was saying that to some friends. I'm like, you got a problem. Just put some compost. On it. <laughs> um, but it's true. And so it's kind of the same thing with tea. It's like, just put, just keep, you, you can't really overdo a compost tea. Now you can, if it goes bad or if it becomes, uh, or if you're feeding the wrong things, but if you're doing just a base stock where you're just taking compost and extracting it and then injecting it, you're good. It's great so stuff. If I'm new to this and I want, I like, okay, now you convinced me I want to do compost tea. Yeah. I love the idea. I love the, what it does to the soil. Now, how, where do I start? So you take the principle of starting small then expanding. So just do a little bit. Don't like, don't go big, go out and buy the, you know, $5,000 brewer and inject it all and, and like go for it because you'll, you'll mess up if you're just yeah. starting, unless you get some consultant and you're like totally dialed in or you, you know, there's a lot of people on these calls in this community who like totally, totally know what they're doing and could make that, that, that jump, you know, um, because they're, they can integrate it into their system. Um, but I always, with anything new, I, I start small and then expand it. And what you can do is you can start with a five gallon bucket or a, a trash can and an aquarium pump and a, um, some people say like a nylon sock or a sock. What I like to get is there's like French drains, um, that you put behind a house, right? And it's usually a perforated pipe and it's covered in a sock. That helps keep the, the the fines out. You can buy those at pretty much any hardware store. You saw them in like hundred foot lengths. It's just a it's just a nylon sock. You can cut that into um, into like a, a a two or three foot length, depending on tie a knot on one side, and then you have your filter bag. You basically make, need to make a tea bag, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some people do a free, just like your tea at home. Like you you, you can put the stuff and have it loose leaf. Right. And have it just brew in there and stuff. The problem with that is, and, and you can do that. It's just when you go to apply it, you have to be really careful about your filtration on that. Yeah. And I've done it both ways and just having it in a sock makes it easier. It just is easier. So having some kind of tea bag um, and then get your compost that you're using um, or worm comp vermicasting is, is amazing. Vermiculture casting, you know, earthworm castings work really good as well. And then if you have like, if, if you're like, oh, I definitely, it's spring, I need to add some nitrogen, you could add a little blood meal to it or, you know, into that same tea bag, you know, um, or if you have kelp, you know, um, and then I always take a little bit of my healthiest soil, or if you have a friend's farm where you're like, man, you got some really good soil, get a <laughs> little, put it in your pocket, take that, you know, we'll go to Jam's farm and just take a little bit That's of soil, scary. you know? Yeah. Yeah. You just go, you just go and, and, and I mean, you should, have, you should get consent and ask for it. You don't want to be stealing soil yeah. from people, but if you get really rich, I mean, I've been to some farms that were going for 40 years, 50 years, and they're just like amazing soil. You know, the microbes in there are just awesome. Right. So he's like, Hey, can I have a little bit of soil? You put some in your pocket, you add that to your mix and then you brew for a minimum of four hours, four to six hours. Yep. Okay. And most likely like a maximum of 12. If you go over 12, then you need to put a little bit of molasses. We're talking like a, in the five gallon bucket, it's a, it's a tablespoon or a half a cup. Um, and that just helps feed and it really expands their growth. And then um, again, just try to time it. So when it really, when the top starts to bubble and you usually can hear the sound, then you're like, okay, I need to apply this. And if you wait for longer than 24 hours or 48 hours, what happens is it starts to digest itself things start to digest themselves and you start to lose that charge and you have to keep feeding it. And after two days, three days, you have, you have stuff in there, but you know, it's aerated and it's expanded, but you've kind of lost that energetic pulse, the charge yeah. of it. Right. But it's still good. It's still more like a tea. Um, but a, a five gallon bucket, an aquarium pump with an air stone and your tea bag water, that soil bag and you're good to go. If you go up to a, a, a 55 gallon drum or a trash can, just get like a hundred, a uh, hundred gallon pump, you know, air pump for a aquarium, you know, just 
boost up your aquarium pump. There's other like you can go to Amazon and find other air pumps. And then you can go to like, you know, brewers that are made and sp start spending money that and there's vortex like I have a vortex brewer that works really well um, where it basically spins the water in a direction and it, like kind of tuning into the like biodynamics component you know and it's like order and then it gets blown up into chaos and then order and so it's like really charging the water as well yeah. um, and that works good and then and then at the very end if you're wanting to tilt the balance, you know, add some of your fish fertilizer that you normally do and add, or add some of your kelp or whatever dilutions that you normally do, just cut it a little bit, not too much. And then just add that to your, to your base stock and you're good to go. Um, you could continue just to like, you know, mix two tablespoons per gallon or whatever it is of your stuff. But if you have this other like kombucha <laughs> or here's oil, they'll just be like, all right. So it's kind of like the same of like, oh yeah, I could, you know, give you some, give you, just give you like a meal, some pizza or whatever. But then if I give you like all these other things, the diversity, you know, is, is a, is a really, really amazing thing. So. That's crazy. Yeah. And then when you're done, you just put it in uh you just spread it all over the garden. Yeah. I mean, um, same, same practices as fertilizing, you know, I usually use the like nine to five time where like when I apply before 9 AM or after 5 PM, um, and depending on the time of year, it, it's again, the more you do, the more you have to do. So if it's like, if you want to get more woo woo about it and be like, okay, it's the end of the day, the energy is going in, right. I'm going to apply my tea as that force is coming into the earth. I'm going to do a soil soak. Or if it's like a foliar, everything's expanding in the morning. So I'm going to do a foliar feed. Um, depending on how you apply it, dep that depends on how you filter it. So if you're going to do it in a backpack sprayer, foliar feed it, you need to, you need to like put it through a, uh, a sieve filter with a cheesecloth or something. You know, or else your backpack sprayer is just totally, you know, you're just, you're <laughs> sorry. I mean, you're just like, um, you're just like, every, you're like, ah, I hate this compost tea. It just clogs my stuff up. Well, it's just the filtering because there's all these little particulates in it. Yeah, right? yeah. So you just get, yeah, that's like a whole extra thing. You just have to like do an extra filtration for it. Um, and then the leftovers in the sock, take that to a fruit tree or take that somewhere and just put it around or put it back in your compost pile, you know, whatever it is um and use that and yeah it's it's good stuff i mean i would say um those who inject and do fertigation too that works really really well you know just uh if you have a you know 50 gallon or ipc tote whatever that you're able to brew in um and then just hook up an injector to that so every time you're feeding you're just you know it's just siphoning in there the mazzy injectors are really awesome people use dosatrons or mixed rights or whatever which i've used but the mazzy injector system is just a venturi it doesn't clog it's awesome there's no moving parts it's just the pressure of the water you know you can also buy those little siphon things that hook onto your your um your hose Yep. And you put one into the thing and then you're just spraying it around. So that works good too. Man, that's amazing. I feel like you said a lot. So I said a lot. <laughs> no, but no, no, but like a lot of super pertinent things. Um, like I couldn't ask for more. It's amazing. That's it. No more questions. No more question for my no. end. Do you have anything else to say? Um, I mean, I would say that like I need we I feel like we need to spread this thing all over the community. Yeah, I mean, compost tea is a is a really good thing. And I, again, like once you start doing it, um, I think I was saying earlier, like you'll forget about it, or you said like why wouldn't you want to do it? Right. That was a question. Like, why shouldn't I do compost tea? And the time is a, is a thing like yeah. the extra, like it is easier. I've had farmers who I've, I've designed. So I design and build like farms and do a lot of consultation and offer this up. And, and I've designed systems that have the compost tea and all that stuff. And I've come back to them and they've like gone back to just the, the concentrated fertilizer. And the reason why is because of time. 
because yeah. they're like, man, I got so much going on. I just need to like, I just got my fertilizer schedule. I just need to come in, pick it up, dump it in, go done <laughs> on to the next thing. And it's like, okay, yeah. And if you slow down, the more you, the, you know, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. So I think there is a, there is like a ethos question there of like how you're feeding and your relationship to your plants. Yeah. But it does take, I mean, there's been many, I mean, so I've been doing this for, you know, a long time and there's been many times I've brewed up a brew and I've come back and I'm like, ah, oh, I missed it. And now I got to clean the brewer after I apply it. I got to do all this. I got to dump it, you know, and then like you don't clean the brewer and then you come back like the next, like three days later and you got like a funky brewer and you're just having to spend another like, you know, 20 minutes cleaning it out to make sure it's right. So, you know, ideally what you do is you set up a system that's kind of already within your flow. That's already like, it's like, and it's designed in a relative location so that those maintenance issues or those clean issues are kind of, you know, designed in. So it's not like an extra effort or an extra step to do stuff. It's kind of like within already a, a procedure that you got going on. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, understanding the longer term effects. I mean, I think I remember Elliot Coleman talking once and he was like, you know, it's like calcium. You can put calcium into your soil through, you know, a certain product, or you can put full oyster shells into your compost and you have this oyster shell that's breaking down over decades. Right. And so it's like, okay, one is like short term. The other one is the long term resiliency. And so I feel like compost tea, even though it's like an immediate action, yeah. has a similar type of long term effects on the plants and on the soil. So even if, even if you're just doing it a few times a year, it's helpful, I think. So even if you're doing it, say at like critical moments, and I'll go back to the tomatoes because they're just such a critical crop where there's certain windows when you're transplanting, when they're going from vegetative to flowering, and when they're going from flowering to fruit, right? You have these, these moments where the plant is like ready to make that transition. And if you come in with the tea that's focused at that transition point, it can really help cabbage. It's just about to head up, right? You know, things like that, where it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to help help the plant at this moment that it's, that it's needing an extra, you know, push. Yeah. So it's like a, a great example is the end of the year, your frosts are, are going to, uh, it's imminent. They're coming. The days are getting shorter. There's still some hot days. Your tomatoes are ripening, but there's a lot of green ones. Right. And you're like, damn, how can I do it? It's like brew up a tea, high phosphorus and just like foliar feed them to really just, push them over you might be you might be doing compost and you might be adding you know top dressings and stuff but that foliar feed again is like it's like the iv you know the stuff on the soil is like is you're eating it the soil has to digest it and transmute it to the plant the foliar is like underneath the leaf at the right time of day nothing better the plant is just it's like going it's getting an iv so it's like putting putting that foliar feed at that right moment can really just help transition the plant. And that's when, that's when you really see a difference. I've seen that with tomatoes, like where they're just like sitting there and everyone's like, why are they still green? Like, when are they going to change? I'm like, kick, kick them with some phosphorus, you know, like get them a little, let's do a high phosphorus seabird guano tea, you know, and with the compost and with the stuff. So they're, they're used to that. It's a simulated. And then you just, or you make, I mean, I've gotten into like making, kind of like the biodynamic uh, compost recipes, right? So you're making piles with specific functions for specific plants, you know, and it's like 22 layer lasagna compost piles. And you're like, oh, I know exactly. You're like, whoa, okay, this is, but that's where, <laughs> but then you're adding certain nutrients and certain things and you have this pile number six or pile number 24 or whatever it is. And you're like, okay, that pile is going to the tomatoes at the end of the year, because we know it has what they need, um, as opposed to just generalized all purpose compost, which is also great. And so again, the more you do, the more you have to do compost tea is awesome. Don't drink it. All right. You, you have, you have to put sometimes on the brewer for plant consumption only. I've, I mean, I taught at an Institute and people were like compost tea. Oh, 
they thought they could drink it. They thought it was like a tea to drink. I was like, no, 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 this is for the plants. And they're like, it's important drink, to mention. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not for human consumption, please. Wow. But it's you know, like um, yeah, yeah, you know, and it's like, I mean, I was showing you earlier, like, this is our garden. These are figs that we just, you know, cut back and stuff. But like the fertility of these plants and everything, we do a lot of stuff for seed and everything. But like, it's, it's like people say, like, I have this golden touch sometimes. They're like, oh, the plants say pie, you know, and stuff. And it's <laughs> like, yeah, the, m the more attention you give something, the better it responds. But it's also <laughs> like what you're feeding, you know, and so. I feel like the glow and the like thing is from the nutrients that they get. And it's a little crazy. It becomes a jungle at times, but, um, but yeah, it's like if people have, if people have questions or they want to like start a new compost tea thread in the community and upload our experiments and talk tea, um, totally great. Uh, just remember like on those recipes and stuff, it's just think of it as yourself. Like I'm not going to give you, Earl Grey before you go to bed. I'm going to give you chamomile, right? Or something. So it's like you want to brew what that plant needs and when they need it and how you do it. So, but there is like a general tea. Um, and so what's the caffeine versus the not? So it's like you got nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. You know, these are like the things that the plants are getting. But then you have just a tea that you can actually brew with plants. I mean, you could go, we could go into a whole thing. Like how do you generate on-site fertility teas? And you go to you go to Comfrey, right? So Ireland, hundred percent nitrogen based fertilizer inputs from Comfrey. There are no import of nitrogen, no fish, no anything. It's just the Comfrey. And then the Comfrey is a bioaccumulator, so it has the it has the um, it has the minerals in it too. And you chop, you know, Comfrey. It's just growing, growing, growing. You just chop it. You put it in a fifty five gallon drum with the weight on it, and it just like compresses and it becomes a sludge after a month so you, and then if you do it with the lunar cycle and everything you get that charge but it's, it's a four-week period and then it just compacts down you get the sludge at the bottom you pour that out and you mix that 40 to 1 and that's your nitrogen fertilizer right mm -hmm. with minerals with you know the micronutrient i mean it has so much in it because it's accumulated from it but you want to make sure you get the comfrey growing from a good patch and not from like here in the urban environment we have this comfrey growing and it's right over this like area that actually has a lot of lead in it. So I'm not going to make compost tea from that because it probably has bioaccumulated some lead, you know? So you really have, it all depends. You have to know where you're getting your source stuff, but that's just one example of like, cause people all the time say, well, I, I want to stop importing fertilizer. And I want to stop importing nutrients. How can I have on farm nutrient source? I, uh, this is so important because uh, I was talking to these people in Tasmania and New Zealand and they have like big issues with that. They can't yeah, compost. So that's so resourceful to use what you have on site. And we didn't even talk about manure teas, right? So then you got goats or chicken, you know, it's like, so you have chicken manure on site because you have your small chickens and you don't have enough for egg production. You're not doing eggs for the community, but you have, you know, 12 chickens that are just generating, you know, some, some eggs for the, for the farmers and family, but they're generating poop or you have a couple of goats and you're just milking it for yourself, but you got, they have poop, you know, or you have the cow or your neighbor's horse or whatever. So that those manure teas is a whole nother one that you also want to brew and do a whole thing or you compost that manure and do it. So it's like, there's a whole nother realm on the fertility cycle there of how to do that. And then you also, if you want to dive into it and start this journey, you, you know, take a class or get more informed, read the books, get a microscope. And then when you, before you apply, you pull out, like you pull out some, you drop it on, you look through the microscope and you, you do a bacterial count or you look at your high feet you know, and you see what's in there and you go, oh, okay. And you do it at four hours and you do it at six hours and you do it at eight hours. And then you're like, oh, okay. It was at, it was at six. It was like between the six to eight hour period. That was the time I need to apply it. Or at eight hours, you're like, oh, we got to apply it now. And that's how, you know, when you geek out on it, that's what you can get. And then so there's the whole, oh man, then you get into like, we have a, one of our farm managers is a master, um, uh, just came on this year and she's a master, master in Korean natural farming. In the ferments, right? So then you go into the ferments where you're then taking your spoiled strawberries, right? That you're going to throw away or compost and you ferment them 
and you make a an actual ferment that you reapply back to the back to the strawberries, right? Or you do, you know, there's all there's like, I mean, she sent us a proposal. I was like, okay, because I've followed natural green farming and like, how do you harvest beneficial indigenous microorganisms and bokashi and all this stuff that you can do? But you know, she's done the course. She's a you know trained with the master, and so she like listed them all out. And I was like, okay, this is like a whole nother level and a whole nother world. And so her her company Entangled uh, Solutions, um, you know, Hope, she's amazing. Um, at, I'm so excited to see what 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 they do once once we start setting up a, a site for them to to really like because that's the biggest thing is we get all these young folks that come on because I went yeah. I went to follow yeah. yeah we'll we'll definitely I mean she's a consultant and that's what in like Korean natural farming here in California is like heavy with the cannabis industry you know it's like because people are like oh how because cannabis and is is super high demand right it you, uh, it's a lot of nutrients and so it's like okay we're, how do we, and they're looking at the costs. How do we cut our costs? Cause at a certain scale, it's like, okay, now I'm buying, you know, 55 gallon drums of fish and, and this is, you know, $700 and whatever. And then you're like, okay, how do I, how do I bring that cost down? Is there any way that we can generate on site compost, on site fertility, you yeah. know? And so how do you, how do you do that? And teas are one, the, you know, the, the ferments are another, the compost on site, you know? And so it's like, how do you close the loop? And how do you bring it? And so, and so the compost tea is, is a, is a tool in your toolkit to help you, you know, feed your soil, feed your crops and bring it in. And, and if you don't use it, that's okay. Just know that it's there and that there's a whole, a whole world to explore with it. And for me at a certain point, at a certain point, you, you understand that you're going to be farming for the rest of your life. <laughs> right. And you're like, what it, what, what keeps it fun? What keeps it exciting? What keeps it, you know, interesting? Oh, and when you start to, when you start looking at some of these, cause it can get really like, oh, like ruling sometimes. Right. And you're like, okay, I got to keep doing it. But then if you're like, oh, I'm going to like mix it up this year and dive into this world. Right. Or I'm going to start seed saving. Like my other big thing is seed saving. Right. And so it's oh, like, okay, yeah. now we're going to like go into saving seeds that's a whole nother realm. And then it's like, okay, what, what do I want to focus on this year? I want to focus on these two crops or I want to focus on, you know, integrating tea into this or making compost there or really looking at the soil health and how to measure that and work on it and build it. And really it comes down to your access and you know, you're going to be doing it for life, but is this the farm that you're on for the whole time? How much do you want to invest in it? And you have to remember you're investing in yourself. Because it's knowledge that no one else can take. So even and and how fortunate we are to steward a piece of Mother Earth, right, of the land. And so, if anything, because some people go, oh, I don't want to invest into this farm because I'll be leaving, and that's a valid thing because it's like, oh, I'm not being recognized for my work or all the work I'm putting in, I'm going to have to leave behind. And it's like, yeah. And what are you leaving? Every farm is influenced and has a has a has a signature or a footprint or an influence from those who have stewarded it every single one so if you have a farmer a person who comes in to your crew and they're super into flowers you're not a flower farmer dedicate a little patch for them to do some flowers and then all of a sudden you might have this little patch that stays and that's their like kind of what they left or you have someone who's like really into tea and guaranteed if your crew new folks who come in and you get them excited about compost tea and say, hey, hey, you know, this is something we want to do. If you guys want to like explore it, you know, on your own time or we'll like dedicate some staff time to it, you'll get a couple of people who like fully geek out on it. And they'll just be like, this is amazing. And then they'll think they know everything about it and tell you how it should be happening. And you're like, okay, <laughs> like you just got exposed to this six months ago. Like <laughs> this is the whole world. Um, and they'll be like, oh, I got the brewer. I got, the I mean, it's happened to me. Like I've like going, oh yeah, tea. And people are like, what do you think about tea? And I'm like, oh, I love tea. And they're like, okay. And then they come back with all this stuff and they start thinking they're going to teach me about it. And I'm like, that's great. I love it. Yeah. And you can do this. And then, and you have to make sure you don't burst their bubble or anything, but there's a lot of, of uh, education and, and enthusiasm that one can harness into this. And in the end, you know, keep it interesting, keep it live, keep it lit. Um, and I'm so I'm so happy that you all are like opening up these ways of getting us to to share 
because that's what it was. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. People didn't have this platform for one, but then there was like a certain competition and protection. And I think now we realize like, oh, it's, it's, it's game on. We got to like really like team up together, share what we know and transform the system, not just create new market opportunities, but really like tr- create a different type of food economy, food system. Um, and so and, much and, openness. Yeah. So it's crazy. Really? Yeah. Man, I love your vision. I love, thank you very much for sharing it with us. It was so, uh, like, I'm mind blown right now. So I just finished another application of compost tea here at the old mill. If you want to see how we made it and the results that we got, you can click on this video. If anything, I'll see you next time. I hope you're well. JM out.